Uh, welcome to an ACM webinar. We're very happy to uh, have you with us. Today's uh, special guest is uh, Daniel Rosenberg. Um, he is founder of RCDO UX and also an adjunct professor at San Jose State University. The uh, webinar is on by the San Francisco uh, Bay Area chapter of the ACM. The ACM was founded in 1957. Its purpose uh, is to promote knowledge of modern computing. It is also um, a place where the computing community um, gets together to support one another, provide um, information and uh, leads for hiring. Uh, we encourage everyone to support us by going to our website, which is sfbayacm.org. And there you'll see a button to join. And it's only $20 annually, and it really uh, helps us coordinate and put on these events. The general um, format for our uh, webinars is that uh, every month uh, we schedule two meetings, one in the area of general computing. Um, it's on the third Wednesday, typically. And the other uh, is for the special interest group specializing in big data, uh, machine learning, and so forth. And that um, typically is on the fourth, a Monday of every month. First, before we um, meet our speaker to uh, let you know a little bit about Professor Daniel Rosenberg. He is a UX consultant. As I said uh, before, he is an adjunct professor of human computer interactions at San Jose State University locally. Uh, he serves on an advisory board of the Interaction Design Foundation and edits Business of UX Forum um, in ACM Interactions Magazine. Professor Rosenberg, is the recipient of the 2019 award at Sig Chai uh, Lifetime Practice Award um, for his contributions and uh, in technical leadership um, to the field of human technology and computer interactions, um, HCI, uh, over the past 40 years. Uh, Dan Rosenberg, um, he's invented uh, many standard GUI design patterns and UX methods that are commonly used in practice today. But currently, he has a new book out, which um, I believe is going to be highlighted uh, in the topic, uh, called UX Magic. Looking forward to this talk, and um, I will hand it over to our guest speaker, uh, Dan Rosenberg. Welcome. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Tonight, I'm um, very happy to talk to the ACM community, of which I am a longtime, many decade member about my new book called UX Magic. And that's kind of a silly name and I'll explain the name in a minute. From a technical perspective, we would call the methodology I'm gonna talk about semantic interaction design. And where did this come from? Well, if you look at my background and my 40 years in the field, I've been involved in a lot of methods and a lot of education, but I've also been an executive for oh, 33 years in the computer industry. So. San Jose State is basically my uh, pre-retirement or potentially I'm told by my wife, my retirement gig, because I'm not allowed to stop working. Um, however, when I started teaching, um, I was uh, asked to teach a class on in interaction design. And given all this background and the methodologies that I had um, invented and um, operationally put into place in 11 years, as the VP of UX design globally for Oracle and seven at SAP. And before that at some other companies you've probably heard of, um, there was no book that I thought really captured um, the methodology, even though I know a lot of people who practice this way. And so I figured, well, I've written books before ranging and some chapters ranging from the first uh, handbook on human computer interaction published in 1988 where I co-authored the rapid prototyping chapter to human factors and product design, which I co-authored with Bill Cushman, um, which was the first human factors book about designing consumer products. Uh, all the previous ones were military and some other books. And then in January of 2020, after 14 months of no consulting and just focusing on the book, it finally came out. And so the story starts here. Um, and for those of you who are in the audience who are designers, um, I, I pose a sort of hypothetical question to you guys um, a bit here, which is what's the first thing you do when you start to create a user experience design? And I don't mean um, the very first thing, I mean when you have to start at the blank sheet of paper. So assuming 
you have all your user research and the journey map and you have great product management and they've defined all the requirements very clearly, right? So we're living in a perfect world, right? Um, but you have all the information you're ever gonna get and now you have a blank sheet of paper or a blank whiteboard in front of you. What were you taught to do? Um, what was I taught to do? And it's a one word answer. The answer is sketch. We were taught to just have this creative catharsis, this magic moment of creative um, spontaneity and start drawing out all kinds of different designs. And when you do that, you're basically working off of your prior experience, knowledge of existing products, knowledge of competitive products, but it's not a very um, optimal approach. And even though this has been kind of the pedagogy and still is in many design schools, I'm here to tell you not to do that. There's simply a better way. You will get to do lots of sketching later, but that is not the place to start. So what is semantic interaction design? It's basically a proven cognitive science-based approach to interaction design that's scalable to the most complex problems, right? Now, Oracle and SAP are pretty complicated. Um, for the last four months, I've been designing uh, the user experience for a next generation genomic sequencer for a fairly large medical um, and scientific company um, and all the apps around it. Well, that's pretty complicated too, right? And I'm gonna show you some medical examples today. But the, in the intent is to be 10X better, 10X better in UX quality um, in terms of your effectiveness and 10X better in efficiency because UX practice today is plagued by a lot of trial and error. Now, I wanna acknowledge that I did not um, pull this methodology out of the air. Um, if you go back and look at the human factors literature, dating back particularly to the work by Phyllis Reisner at IBM Watson Labs in 1979, um, the notion of a task action grammar um, to measure the complexity of computer interactions emerged. And there was parallel work in Europe by Spence and Apperley and other people. Uh, and this was all involved the psychology of computer use and the psychology of programming. And then there are uh, a lot of periods in the development of cognitive science as a field and different theories that are relevant, such as stages of action from Don Norman, much earlier than that, 20 years earlier, um, the notion of design by levels from James Foley, um, who most of you I assume know as having invented with Andy Van Dam, um, computer graphics as we sort of know it today, perhaps a little bit past Ivan Sutherland. Um, and Jim is now a uh, retired professor emeritus from Georgia Tech, um, worked by Bonnie Nardi on activity theory and worked by Ben Schneiderman. Norman Foley and Schneiderman have all read the book um, because I've got feedback from them um, for my version too. Uh, but there was also a movement in the 1990s by uh, David Collins on a notion of object-oriented UX, which also has a bit of the foundation. Um, the kind of formal practice starts in terms of what's documented, a book um, called Conceptual Models by Jeff Johnson and Austin Henderson, who were both part of the original Xerox PARC team that invented the graphical user interface. And if I'm not mistaken, Jeff was recently made an ACM fellow. Um, this book kind of it lays out, it's a thin paperback, the foundation of the grammar layer, but it doesn't um, cover the whole stack. So what I did in UX Magic, and I developed this over five years of teaching and a refinement with my graduate students at San Jose State to try and invent the complete system for both practice and pedagogy. So as I mentioned before, the value prop is faster, better. Um, and by faster, I mean fewer iterations, minimizing work um, and uh, cognitive load increases due to feature creep, fewer stakeholder meetings, and making more accurate trade-off decisions. Um, and by optimal UX, by 10x better, I mean minimum number of screens, shortest flows, lowest cognitive load possible, and basically easily ready to scale to the next version. Now, 10x, an order of magnitude better is a audacious claim, to put it mildly. Um, and so I'm gonna tell you about two case studies. There's a lot covered in the book. One was from my SAP period. When I joined SAP, 
um, to head up global design. So 15, 16 years ago, SAP had a fairly awful uh, set of user interfaces for a customer relationship management product, uh, thousands of screens. My team was able with a new user experience, but using the same legacy backend, get that down to hundreds. And then in a move to the cloud, four years later with a complete re-architecting, literally down to a dozen screens and a five screen iPad app and almost all functionality transferred. There was some fringe stuff that product management had the courage to throw out. But again, when you look at this numerically, that's an over hundred X reduction in the number of screens for the same functional scope. A more recent example from my consulting days um, is a uh, electronic medical record system for radiation cancer treatment. And these are some of the legacy screens from that system. <clears throat> In this case, the client is very medical systems in Palo Alto, which some of you may be familiar with, right? And there was approximately 800 screens in the legacy on-premise um, EMR. And here are some screens from the cloud replacement, which got down to about 45 screens. So for a doctor, there's five main ones that they actually spend their day in. The first one being their um, kind of console, which has got these sort of cards and each card represents an object, kind of an internet of things. Some of the information comes from patients. Some of it is lab values coming in. And this is looking at all their patients and their day. And we'll see a lot of examples from this EMR because it's easy to use in the book since I designed um, and was a UX architect for this project, um, I understand the logic um, and the decisions uh, behind it. This view is kind of a feed view, which is about a single patient using kind of a social pattern. And then there's a screen that's the primary patient chart that looks pretty much like a patient chart. And um, you can't really change that too much for legal reasons. This looks like an 18X compression in the number of screens. But that number is actually low by about a factor of three. The original product was only for managing radiation cancer treatment. The new product does radiation, chemo, surgery, and genomic medicine. And in addition, the new product has all kinds of decision support capability, which was never in the old product. So there's probably a 3x increment in functional scope <clears throat> and an 18x reduction in the total screen count. So without explaining the measurement of cognitive load, which I'll come to later, um, I think you could agree that that <clears throat> would be a substantial improvement and a system that millennial doctors would find attractive to use and efficient to use. So when would you do this? Well, again, I wanna be very clear that what I'm gonna talk about is not a full life cycle UCD method. Right. Most users, uh, UX teams are going to have some kind of cyclical iterative process, starting with their planning and their discovery research, a design production and uh, conceptual phase, adaption, measurement and usability labs in the field. The point of this particular method is to become a Jedi in the pure design activity, as I noted in my intro. Once the research is done, if you have good research, you can do good design if you know what you're doing. If you have bad research um, leading up to design, then it's a garbage in, garbage out problem. But you can also, as we always say in the wine country in California, you can make bad wine from good grapes. You can have very good user research and still create a miserable user experience. So the other phases are important, but that's not what I'm here to talk about and I'm actually not expert in any of the other phases. Another reason why this is important is because design Darwinism, which is a popular trend, not only in Silicon Valley, but in a lot of the consumer software world really doesn't work. Quality is achieved by, not by eliminating defects through trial and error, it's by having um, an optimal design from the beginning, even though you will of course iterate even from that kind of highly optimized. And, I do a lot of medical product design in my consulting work and you don't A-B test to see if patients die. Um, I've done two diabetes products, one cardiology, two cancer, 
and now the genomic system is clinical, for, um, FDA approved, right? You have to actually get this stuff right. Now, I'm gonna break the how into two parts, the theory and the practice. The theory is pretty straightforward. There's two cognitive science principles and we need to be able to operationally apply them at four modular levels. And the modular levels I'm gonna walk you through in this presentation, that's kind of our structure. The grammar level, the syntax and semantics of the conceptual model, uh, very similar to the Jeff Johnson and Austin Henderson book, but with some additions, the how you visualize that in design patterns, how you make it flow from screen to screen, and optionally the introduction of game theory if you're trying to uh, in incentivize or manipulate people on certain paths in the experience. So the two foundational issues and uh, concepts from cognitive science are first that language is the basis of conscious thought in humans. It's not the basis of all thought in humans. We have the lizard brain, which is responsible for the fight and flight mechanism and emotions and a few other things. Um, but if you have to solve any problem, use a new application, walk up to a kiosk at a bank that you've never seen before, you use natural language to figure out the puzzle. And we know um, from four decades of research that language grammar correlates with cognitive load. We know that Mandarin Chinese is one of the most complicated and cognitively demanding languages. We know that the Semitic languages like Hebrew and Arabic or have very regular structure and are actually easier to learn. And English is kind of in the middle with a lot of exceptions and inconsistencies and redundancies. Now, cognitive load can be measured in a usability lab, um, but of course you need an entire artifact. You need a prototype or something that you can have people try to use. What's new, and I wanna tell you, is that cognitive load can actually be predicted in advance of drawing the first screens without even going to the prototyping level. And that is the basis of what we're gonna um, learn how to apply today. So just to qualify and define my terms, if we looked at a traditional GUI, right, we would have the notion of objects and actions. We would see actions as being in pull down menus, for example, objects or things that we click upon um, and act upon, they can be abstract or they can be very um, graphical, like what I'm showing here for drawing program. And we have attributes, right? Objects have a set of attributes. These attributes may be hierarchical and have complex relationships themselves. So here's how the math works. <clears throat> In my career, I've had the opportunity to redesign two word processors and design one from scratch. The ones I had to redesign were actually DOS products. So that's how old it was uh, and long ago, or how old I am. And those word processors were miserable to use. They had a ton of key commands and <clears throat> function keys, and they were all very inconsistent. So while a user would basically think of a word or a paragraph or a document as an object, there were a lot of inconsistencies and um, redundancies. So you'd have a different key command for getting rid of a character when you were typing than you would have, say, for example, for um, deleting a page. And you'd have a lot of duplicates and you ended up with basically a conceptual model of objects and actions that was very sparse and sparse is very bad. In a perfect world, right? And this of course is what your expectation would be in a modern graphical user interface. You wouldn't have the redundancies and you'd have a perfectly dense matrix, right? So you'd have something like cut, copy and paste which were all invented by Larry Tesla. Um, and you'd have your objects. And I think everybody can agree that, right? If you were to design your screens and your actions around a very dense grammar, there's less to learn and less to understand. But how does the math work? Actually, the math works like this. If you want to get not an absolute measure of cognitive load, but a scalar approximation of cognitive load in that perfectly dense matrix of the conceptual model, 
cognitive load is going to grow as the number of actions plus the number of objects. That's the load you're putting on human beings. As the matrix gets sparse, it becomes uh, an approximation where the formula is actions times objects. Now, if you have a PhD in cognitive science, forgive me, there's some coefficients and other things we can put in here, but from a practical engineering standpoint, this is really all you need to know. One small detail, this question comes up every time I give this talk. Obviously, there's no perfectly dense matrix. What's the inflection point seem to be? And the research um, that we've done on this, and my grad students have done, um, in a lot of cases, shows about 20 or 30%. So if you have a grammar with you know, less than 30% white space, you're, pro you're, you're not at the, uh, the inflection point of the curve. But cognitive growth, cognitive load will grow exponentially as you get sloppy in your um, conceptual model. Now, what would a real conceptual model look like? So in that electronic medical records example that I cited before, this is pretty much the conceptual model that we came down to um, with some iteration. Um, you have objects which are the patient, a medical record, so kind of looking backward, a treatment plan looking forward, and then a bunch of operational stuff like appointments, tasks, and messages, and then a care team, um, a pool of clinicians and specialists, because if you have cancer, you have a lot of doctors. And the main goal of a, a medical uh, solution like this is to keep the doctors coordinated. And you have almost standard computer science operators, right? You need to create an update. You never delete in a medical product you void. And then there's a lot of workflows. So you have actions like accept, reject, approve, delegate. And then you have to refer. This is a medically specific action, referring the patient to another specialist. So that is a real example. And we'll come back to it later on how you implement it. So now let's look at the how from a really practical standpoint, just the grammar layer. Where do objects and actions come from? Well, they come again from natural language. Nouns map to objects, verbs map to actions. And an adjective in natural language maps to the attribute of an object. And so the process looks kind of like this. You try to define all the objects and actions. You enumerate um, all the attributes for every object. And you need to prioritize them because every object action pair translates to a task in your user experience. And not all tasks are equally important to users, nor are they equally important to the business. So, Agile software practice makes this easy in some ways because we were trained to create user stories as a unit of work. Now, if you're but a then, UX, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, your 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 speech game is breaking off. I don't know what to do about that. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. Uh, it sounds good to me. I don't hear any uh, broken. Okay. It, it's very minimal. I, I heard some, but it was very minimal. Okay, now. Just keep going, please. Okay. <clears throat> I will keep going because I don't know if there's anything I can do to adjust it on my end. Um, okay, so where I was, uh, what was the notion of looking at your user stories for your software. And you can kind of go in and say, <clears throat> and I use a dog rescue as a, a website solution like the Humane Society as one of my case studies. And you can say, as a parent, I want to, parent being an object, I want to find action, a friendly attribute dog object that will help teach my children person object, again, to be responsible. As an elderly widow, person object, living alone, I want to adopt action, a dog for my protection attribute, dog being an object. And when you go foraging for these nouns and verbs in the user stories, you will end up with a lot of possible candidates and a very sparse matrix. 
what you then do is you try to pivot them so that you want to, for example, a calendar is not an object. A calendar is just a design pattern and events um, probably belong to the organization. And you try and compress to the minimum number of objects and you try to compress to the minimum number of actions by making as many actions as possible be an attribute state change for the objects. And you can crush it down to something that looks like the table on the right. And if you just look at this, which students do in class in the first exercise in about half an hour, you know, we've gone from a scalar approximation of cognitive load of 66 to um, a more linear approximation of about nine um, with a 7.3x um, improvement. Um, I'm also hearing from some of the panelists a bunch of background noise. So maybe whoever's on the panel for Zoom might want to mute because that may be causing some of the sound quality issue. Okay, so we do these pivots, we compress, and then we go and figure out the attributes. And this is a very small set of the attributes, right? Um, the dog or an animal will have species, age, and breed. Uh, most importantly, importantly, a personality that we can match it to a human being who wants to adopt. So while the attribute tables can be very large, um, attributes are not in the formula for cognitive load because they don't add significant weight. Human beings have two types of um, memory. We have uh, kind of, rec well, we have short-term and long-term, but in terms of the, the deeper look at human memory, we have uh, recognition what we see and recognize like written words and what we can recall. And we recall from deep memory. Recall puts a lot of weight and pressure on cognitive load. Recognition, human beings are really good at. We're the world's best um, pattern matchers. We're better than any other animal. We recognize all kinds of things in terms of pattern matching. You can recognize a, a breed of dog that you've never seen before as a dog. Um, because you're such a good pattern matcher. And then as I noted, we would need to prioritize these object action pairs. In the human factors terminology, these would be tasks uh, represented by an object plus one or more actions, um, but they're not all equally important. Some of them are done frequently by many, many users um, and should only be never more than a click away. Some are done rarely, but by many users, like creating an account. Everybody's got to do that flow and needs to be successful. But if you're not um, going to do that over and over and over again. And then, of course, there's tasks that are done by very few people and only rarely. Maybe they're administrative tasks. Now, for consumer products, which have a uh, monetization by click, I recommend either a row or column to separate out those object action pairs um, that generate money and not confuse them with the ones that people really want to do because most of these are advertising related. If you're doing enterprise software or medical software, you don't need this row uh, at all. So if you only use the first layer, then there's three things that you could apply immediately. First, while I am explaining this as a design method, it's also very valuable as a heuristic evaluation method to assess the cognitive load of existing products. And while heuristic evaluations are most often thought of as the 20 some year old Jacob Nielsen, uh, I think it's eight or 12 heuristics that you look at, it's, which is a very qualitative approach. This will give you a quantitative approach um, to uh, retroactively assessing existing software experiences. And with no disrespect to Jacob, he and I co-authored a book together in the 80s um, and still talk to each other. Um, I think this is a better method. Now, if you're starting from scratch, right, this is the way to go, right? Because if you can figure out the conceptual model and get it as tight as possible and then start working on the actual screens, you are gonna be in a much better place in terms of quality. And then third, and the evolution of existing products, since we know that attributes don't add much cognitive load, if you have to add new features to an existing product, 
um, try adding them in the experience design as attributes of existing objects and not introducing new and additional objects. Now, let me go to the second layer, visualization. Here, we're gonna talk about design patterns and this area blows up into layers of both um, design and code, right? We have raw components like buttons, um, widgets, which are bigger collections of uh, GUI controls. An archetype is a page template that would be recognizable. And then the notion of an IXD language, um, when you start to put it all together, and then I'll also comment briefly on UX architecture. And while I'm going to explain this bottom up, it's often practiced top down or oscillating between top and bottom. Just to clarify my terminology, buttons are the very raw GUI elements. Um, you take a, bu a button and a label and you put 35 buttons and 42 labels together and you have a grid that starts to look like a calendar. Add a few controls and you have a date picker. And eventually this pattern scales up and becomes what we think of as a calendar page, the archetype screen. And it doesn't matter, excuse me, it doesn't matter if it's a Google calendar or an Outlook calendar um, or whatever calendar in your CRM product, you know that's a calendar. So let's look at components. The original components for graphical user interface were primarily designed by our founders of the GUI world at Xerox PARC to represent attributes. A few of them like buttons um, and icons were meant to represent actions. Hypertext links came um, a decade or more later as one way to represent an action. Very rarely would one of these represent an object. And I'm not gonna read you the table, only that the X's sort of represent probably the most common case and the small X's may be a more secondary case. When you're designing a system for a product or family of products, um, you wanna knock out probably 30% of these X's. You wanna be hyper consistent and say, we're only gonna use this control, um, for example, a button for a major action. Now, I'm gonna look, show you some examples and why as long as the visualization is different, you're okay. And also I'm gonna show you some bad examples. These two pieces of LinkedIn are really part of the same screen. You're probably all familiar with it. Here we have a menu, a card representing an attribute um, or let's say an object of uh, the attributes of a job object, right? And here we have another menu control which is more actions associated with my account and profile. Because these have totally different visualizations, there's no cognitive dissonance between the two. If this action menu had a bunch of cards in it, it would become confusing. These actions would be represented identically as objects. Now here's an example um, that's a problem from Yelp. So the tab control, which usually when people introduce me, they point out that I did invent the tab control, which is correct. And it was so long ago that the design patent has expired. Um, but we have two tabs being used basically as filters for messaging below. And then the third tab is actually a button, an action button to create a new message. This, uh, and it's in the same color as the unselected tab. So this is a significant semantic mistake. And while it might not be fatal in Yelp, this kind of mistake kills patients in medical products. Let me go on to widgets. So widgets are the bigger assemblies of those controls. We have the table, the master detail, uh, layout forms, cards, uh, wizards, et cetera. They often represent objects. Now, if I'm designing a product or a standard for a product family, I would get rid of 50% of these X's, right? And tighten up so I'm hyper consistent that cards are only used to represent objects, for example. Now, about six months before the book came out, the Google material team um, found out about the book and they asked me to give them a preview. And I did use Google material, the engineering team chose it, not me, for the medical products. So I am pretty familiar with it. And this is an example from the material standard at the time. I don't know if they've improved it. Where we have the card, in this case, 
in, representing an object. And we have a local action in purple in the lower left corner. And we have a card which is representing an attribute, the temperature in Hong Kong, and a local action in the lower left corner. This local action on the reserve to reserve a table at the restaurant is transactional. Money changes hands. It moves the flow of the experience forward. It's grammar relevant. This expand <clears throat> and collapse of the weather card is not grammar relevant. So these actions are not equivalent, um, yet they have the same color, same location, same typeface, um, and all caps. So again, I would consider this a semantic error, which again, in the context of a medical product or an avionics product um, or an expensive instrument can kill a patient or a passenger. You'll notice my table of widgets was relatively short. That's because there's a lot of widgets that are just containers. A dialog box doesn't have semantic properties. A dialog box takes on the semantic properties of the content that is in it. The same is true of a toolbar. And controls like zoom, pan, and scroll don't matter semantically either because they only change the view in the world of the model view controller. They don't actually move the flow forward. Now, archetypes. There are a lot of archetypes <clears throat> that people recognize, and we'll talk about the population um, that recognizes them. In this case, I'd knock out 70% of the Xs if I was designing a product or a product family, but we have the catalog. We have the funnel, like a shopping cart pattern or PayPal. And we recognize the desktop and operating systems or the portal of a new site. We recognize tool and canvas uh, designs um, for drawing from PowerPoint to AutoCAD, workspaces for coding with synchronized windows, et cetera. Again, these patterns need to be mapped to the grammar and then they need to be uh, held hyper consistent. So if you were to take a look at Facebook now as an example, and I kind of deconstructed for you using the language of semantic interaction design, we have global actions at the top, a bunch of local actions like adding a story, some local actions like joining a group. The objects of record are basically people and conversations. Content is always just an attribute. But then if we looked at this panel, and I know they changed this about six months ago and it still doesn't make any sense. Um, we have with the exact same visualization, objects, actions, attribute filters, and different actions. So again, I would say this is a mess because the visualization is identical, but the semantics that it represents are uh, quite different. And now, if you put all of that together and you talk about an IXD language, right? Because all of this has to go in motion um, and be used with the grammar and the widgets moving across archetypes. The question is, are you consistently expressing the grammar in every design decision you make? And so here, I'm gonna show you a case study from the medical product, the cancer EMR. And we're gonna do a day in the life journey of an object in an action. I'm gonna start with the appointment action. So in general, you won't need to have gone to medical school to understand my examples. And we're gonna watch the appointment action. I'm sorry, the appointment object. <clears throat> in the landing page for doctors, which uses the swim lane archetype um, with vertical columns of cards that represent objects, and I've cleaned it up to make it really easy to follow, right? We have the appointment object. If I click on the object, there's a consistent behavior and the card opens up. The, this object has a mashup of attributes of the appointment, um, like what room it's in, but also the diagnosis of the patient. Um, doctors love this, right? Particularly on the mobile version, they're running down the hallway doing 30 consults a day. They can look at their phone at the calendar and see the latest state of the patient. So here from a functional perspective, um, there are attributes of two objects really mashed into this one little widget. Then there's a local action menu and the actions are contextual to the role of the logged in user. And from doctors, the most common one is to create a task for a nurse or a lab tech to do something on behalf of this patient. 
they're not going to manage the calendar. Go to the calendar screen in here, and the primary user would be the front desk clerical person. The same appointment object exists. I'm showing it already in the expanded state, but the local action menu is optimized for that role, which is primarily either creating new appointments or canceling and moving them around. And of course, this screen would have the almost like a pinball game with all kinds of uh, every slot filled in with multiple appointments um, because this uh, front desk person would be managing all the patients coming in that day. Move to a portal archetype page. And here we have the appointment card, again, the object, and um, the patient photos moved out because all the patient information, now that we're talking about one patient, Josephine Baker, moves to the header and the act local action menu is now a shared global action menu for all the new things you can do for Josephine to create appointments and tasks and messages, et cetera, or do a referral. The mashup of uh, medical attributes remains in this appointment because there could be multiple diagnoses. So this happens to be the primary diagnosis, but if Josephine was um, having uh, a uh, like the equivalent of gestational diabetes reaction to chemo, this could be about um, treating the, uh, the diabetes, um, not about treating the cancer because that was a side effect. So here we've just seen hyper consistent action object relationship for the appointments. Now I'll take you through one, another quick tour. This one's a little more complicated. The void action. In medical products, you strike out data if you make a mistake, there's no deletion. So for forensic purposes, everything stays in the record. So now we have a patient, Erna McDougall. And here we have a card in the diagnosis screen for the uh, malignant neoplasm of prostate cancer, right? Now, this is a medical error. Um, we're going to assume that Erna is, credit, is coded correctly as a female patient. So some intern botched um, setting up the case. And um, as long as Erna did not have gender reassignment surgery, in which case she would still have a prostate, but it would be in a very different location, let's assume this is a medical error, right? So I would come in and I would click void diagnosis. Very straightforward. Um, the content is struck out. It's only shown because an include voided filter is checked, but as soon as that's unchecked, we have a clean um, working look of the diagnosis. And here there's only a primary diagnosis, but this can get very hierarchical um, and there can be more than one. Um, and that can be clicked on and expands like the other cards to a very complicated card, which frankly can't be made any simpler because staging cancer is very complicated. But what I wanna point out is um, actions exist at both the global level, like voiding the entire diagnosis, but if you make a mistake in the staging and picking the wrong stages, or you get an update with a new pathology report, um, the void action also works at the local level, and so that has to be hyper-consistent at the local level as well. And we're in a kind of a canvas um, archetype. Okay, if you click forward to the documents section, of the patient chart, you have the same issue. Somebody um, uploads an incorrect document for a different patient, you'll have to void it and you'll have to have the same behavior. And if you go uh, further into the journal, which is freeform notes between doctors and nurses, again, if you type something and you actually saved it, you would have to void it. And once you void it, there's no undo. If you decided you didn't want to avoid it, you'll have to type that note again. But again, hyper consistent behavior of the void action across multiple archetypes um, and multiple types of data. And finally, I'm going to speak very briefly about UX architecture at a kind of um, hyper trivial level, you could equate UX architecture with information architecture, but they're really orthogonal topics and they're, they're both important. But if you were to think of each of these boxes as a screen, 
sorry. Each of these boxes is a screen. Then you have a serial flow like a shopping cart checkout. You have hierarchical organizations of pages and screens. You have hub and spoke, the matrix where you can go anywhere, but you keep transiting through other states of screens and the network where you have major object pages and the user can go anywhere um, from anywhere. This one and the matrix in particular are really only suitable for professional use, um, heavy duty um, products. So the point that I wanna make <clears throat> is uh, this uh, selection of architecture uh, interacts with grammar. If you look at any one of these, of the five uh, major architectures for organizing an application, they have eight human factors criteria, ranging from location awareness to efficiency to learnability. And they're all better or worse in each of these dimensions. So for example, a serial flow like a wizard, you have very high location awareness. You can't get lost. Um, the network, you can definitely get lost. However, the serial flow is very inefficient. It's low, right? Um, the network is really high if you know what you're doing. So when I'm working on UX, I will often start with some of the architectural patterns after the grammar is done and then look at how to refine the grammar and optimize it for the different cases. In the medical EMR case study, we actually looked at hierarchical hub and spoke and network. And I'm not gonna tell you which one we chose. We can save that for the Q and A because you can't even tell from the screens I showed you since everything's so modular and consistent. But the grammar, when we looked at these, um, changed by 10 or 15% to really optimize for the way you were gonna navigate on top of the grammar. And note in the network, you can only have very few objects um, or it, it uh, fails. Okay, so who understands all this stuff about visual interpretation of design patterns and GUI? Well, actually 5 billion people, including every one of you who's listening to this, walk up to every screen you see, new screen, and you process it with a priori understanding and expectations based on the layout of that screen and the way actions are identified even at the word level and at the shape level, if they're in buttons or links. The other 2.7 billion people on the planet who are not part of the digital economy yet, and whether they're literate or not, and by literate, I mean they can read, um, the only way that they can associate what's going on in the digital world and become part of it is by looking at physical world metaphors of objects and actions that they understand and trying to map that metaphorically to what they see on the screen. And of course, if you're trying to teach a person who's not digitally literate, um, it would most likely be an elderly parent for some of us. Um, this is the only way you can explain it to them. Um, I'm not gonna get into how pre-literate children learn user interfaces. I've seen grandchildren being remarkably facile by age two with iPads. And I think there's something completely different going on um, than what we're talking about here. Of course, again, for most of you listening, the 99% of the digital economy is in that first 5 billion, but please don't use that as a reason to um, ignore making the lives of the other 2.7 pe billion people better. And now I'm gonna very quickly, um, because I will wrap up on time uh, at the top of the hour, um, talk about flow and game theory. So assuming you have <clears throat> the fewest numbers of actions and objects, you're gonna have the fewest screens. But there's a little bit more to it than that that I wanna say, just one or two slides. If we go back to the pet adoption, get a dog at the Humane Society, um, and we look at the donate flow, very simple flow. Um, the flow would use the Jesse James Garrett way of using flowchart symbols to show interaction design and assume that boxes represent objects um, and lines basically represent actions, then actions basically propel objects through the experience flow. So while you would look at and imagine a very simple flow for donation, like go to the home screen, somewhere I click and get to a donate page, maybe I 
sidestep to a volunteer page because volunteering is like money. And then maybe there's a thank you screen and I need to know where to route people if we know who they are or they don't. An action propels me from the home screen to the donate screen. Another action propels me from the donate screen to the thank you screen. And when we look at the, the objects, right? Uh, it'll be the home screen of the pet rescue site, which will probably have several objects, some dogs, some happy owner stories, right? The money object, and then thank you is all about the organization and its mission and how you're fulfilling it. So it's really that simple. Actions propel objects through the flow and you'll have the shortest flows and the most fail-safe flows because you simply have the fewest objects and actions if you use this approach. And finally, game theory. Okay, um, can you motivate human beings to favor specific object action pairs? In the world of interaction design, there are three flavors of game theory that are relevant. And in all of them, we wanna minimize cognitive load. In pure game design, we wanna increase cognitive load up to a point, not too far, but enough to make it challenging. But if we're adding gamification to an enterprise app or a medical product, um, or even a consumer product, we don't wanna make it harder. So gamification is flavor one. And it's basically the addition of reward elements to incentivize uh, work. Gameful interaction design is a technique where you create a substitute game. So it's a proxy for the transactional task. This may be a little hard to imagine, but think of a screen right now that looks like Tetris. But when you get all the boxes, the colored boxes lined up, you've actually filled out an expense report and it goes off to your boss to get approved. In Captology, stands for Computers as Persuasive Technology and is, originates with the work of BJ Fogg at Stanford, um, is about persuading people to change their behavior using digital products. How does this map to UX magic and conceptual models? Well, it's actually pretty straightforward. Gamification provides action incentives. Gameful interaction design focuses on manipulating the objects and creating substitute ones. And captology is all about manipulating attributes, like telling you only three left at this price in the warehouse, when in fact the warehouse is full of them, but to either give you additional information or modify how information is presented to convince you mostly to buy stuff. Why would we apply game theory? Well, in all these software domains, we're trying to either increase or decrease some human behavior. In the enterprise, we might be trying to increase productivity and decrease boredom. In the medical world, we might wanna increase healthy behavior and reduce unsafe behavior, like not taking your insulin on time. And it goes on and on, but we're looking at um, changing behavior and in all forms of game, applied game theory for interaction design, we are targeting intrinsic motivators and extrinsic motivators. Intrinsic motivators are how we feel about ourself um, and are motivated by curiosity, mastery of um, something, uh, right? Musicians, for example, like myself, it's mastery of a new piece of music or a new musical instrument. It's completely intrinsic. Um, badges and rewards, fear of failure, fear of punishment, greed, these are extrinsic motivators and they're based on how people um, feel they will be perceived or treated in the actual physical world outside of their own uh, inner self. When you look at applications of game theory, um, and this screen in the center is one of my favorites, it's the owner's portal from the Nissan Leaf electric car. And whoever designed this was really good at gamification. I had nothing to do with it. And we're looking at a collaborative game where drivers in Australia and in the United States and in Europe um, are competing to save trees, a tree equaling a carbon offset. And so here we have a social competition design of a game. And when you look at game design and you look at the literature, what you will see is the terminology of game mechanics. And so here there's connection, there's feedback, there's a narrative about saving the planet that people are um, experiencing, right? So these are the ones that I see 
um, is probably the most prominently used here. A game mechanic, if you map it back to semantic interaction design, is a combination of a flow and an archetype. And there's about uh, two dozen common game mechanics, but you can map it exactly back to what I've told you before. Uh, like a dashboard is an archetype. This is a dashboard. Um, and there's a certain kind of flow that goes on with it to get people to take action. And in this case, it's multi-channel because trees grow on the dashboard of your car when you're driving. This is all around you. Um, this is a legally acquired slide from Facebook. Um, and this is um, their design for using game theory to drive engagement. And they're intentionally inducing social pressure, unpredictability, and scarcity. And these are some of the mechanics that they are using. But again, a mechanic is just a combination of an archetype and a flow pattern, right? So um, that may be not a <clears throat> very positive use, and you might feel manipulated. But most of my work in game theory has to do with uh, patient-facing medical products. And these are a few screens from the Blue Star um, diabetes solution for patients. This is the first instance of digital medicine. This has been out now for many years. Um, it's FDA class two approved um, as a medical solution and it's legally a pharmaceutical. It has a drug reimbursement code. It's prescribed by doctors and reimbursed by insurance companies or sometimes employers. And in clinical trials in multiple countries, it's been shown that high-risk type two diabetics um, who use this as their, their buddy, basically, um, will get an average A1C reduction of two points, A1C being your um, blood glucose level. Metformin, which is the leading pharmaceutical for type two diabetes, if you're non-insulin dependent, um, has a 1.8 average in clinical trials. So here, the application of game theory and a very sophisticated expert system, a lot of research, um, can, without any drug interactions, motivate patients to better health. And that's the end of my preview. So I kind of gave you the what, when, why, and how. Um, again, for those of you who are UX people, please remember, we're only talking about being a Jedi with this methodology and the design step, every other thing still matters. Um, but frankly, they're necessary, but not sufficient. Because if you fail at the design, um, obviously, the product will fail from a usability standpoint, but it'll fail from a market standpoint as well. I did not give you a preview of everything in the book. The book is about 350 pages long. Um, but we covered a lot. Um, there is a chapter that's dedicated to pure graphic design, and how to and reinforce the semantics, not in the selection of your patterns, but literally colors, fonts, layout. And um, there's a section on, called myth, which is about how all of this relates to style guides and when to ignore the major style guides that all of the platform producers um, like Apple and Microsoft or the enterprise vendors like SAP and Salesforce and Oracle push when to follow them and when to ignore them and then they screw up your conceptual model. And then chess is kind of a rant on the future of design and the design profession, very short chapter to just wrap up the book with some observations of where all of this is going. We really scratched the surface <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, the book's available on Amazon. The publisher is the Interaction Design Foundation, which is a nonprofit in Denmark that I happen to be on the board of. Um, and uh, just one quick addendum before I stop talking. Um, if you found this interesting, I would ask you to tell your colleagues and post on social media, help spread the word. My goal is that this really becomes the standard pedagogy and practice. And while that sounds audacious, uh, my book with Bill Cushman, Human Factors and Product Design became the de facto textbook um, in industrial design and industrial engineering programs throughout the 90s. Uh, and so I'm hoping to do that again and up level the whole field. Um, but I can only do that if um, you help me spread the word uh, that this is a new and better way to do things. 
And if you are a UX manager or leader, I do have corporate training classes for all of this. Um, and I do that somewhat regularly, similar to the same material I use for my graduate students. But I also have uh, material available on how you map semantic interaction design into the field of data visualization, which is orthogonal in one direction, and information architecture, which is orthogonal in another direction. They both, um, they all intertwine. They all do come together really well. Um, but I didn't include data viz and info architecture or in UX magic because it would have been a 700 page book if I did that. And it was taking a long time anyway. And that's the end. So I will um, throw it open to QA. And I think somebody on the panel, please explain how you want to handle the QA to the audience. Okay, um, there are eight questions um, and I will hope to um, be able to get to them. So should I just feed them to you? Yes. Okay, uh, the first one, why do you call the book UX Magic? I call it magic because a lot of people, including executives that I deal with, both when I was in industry and as a consultant, think that design is magic. And they think that the creatives, um, people a little younger than me, often with purple hair and a lot of body piercings and tattoos, um, just are able to uh, magically invent and come up with all these ideas. Um, and that's really not what's happening. People are relying on their recall of prior experience and it doesn't have to be magic, right? There is a science to it. And by taking a slightly more scientific approach, you could just be faster and better. So I thought if I was gonna make a traditional textbook and have a traditional publisher, I'd probably have to call it semantic interaction design is the real title. But since I didn't, and there's a lot of war stories and jokes and a lot of science fiction metaphors, um, I took a funnier title. Oh, great. Um, so what are some of the ways to measure cognitive load? Um, this is a kind of a humorous comment that doesn't involve putting someone into a PET scanner. Okay. So <clears throat> um, there's three ways. The, quantita the quantitative way is um, you have these, uh, um, the ECG sensors, these helmets that can measure brain waves and there are predictions um, and metrics that come off of those. Um, as people get frustrated, um, you see different uh, electrical patterns in the brain. The qualitative way, which is um, having people do self-assessment of cognitive load is um, something that NASA invented um, and it's called the NASA TLX measurement technique. The least invasive way of doing it, um, which is not, which is quantitative, but um, kind of an approximation is that if you use an eye tracker, even an inexpensive eye tracker, while people are in a usability lab, pupil diameter is a proxy for cognitive load. So for a given subject, you can watch pupil diameter and I forgot if it increases or decreases when they get frustrated um, and load increases, but there's a, there's a literature on um, how to use cognitive, how to use eye tracking as a scalar indication of whether cognitive load is going up or down. Great. Wow, there was so much um, thought provoking um, information in your talk. I think I, it feels like I should um, only uh, ask one more question, which is a very pragmatic question from someone who says, is there a discount code for the book? No. <laughs> okay, great. The book is full color. And honestly, Amazon is the only company that makes money on the book. Wow. Because it's print on demand. Um, the publisher and I um, split a trivial amount of money, but that was the easiest way to make it available worldwide. Um, but it's ridiculous how much they take and they charge for the printing and they take it out of your royalties. All right, well, I'd like to thank you so much for your presentation. I think everyone thought um, it was, again, so thought provoking and for those that are not in the field, um, very um, uh, mind expanding, um, involving a lot.
lot of, almost all of humanity. So um, I, I'm very interested in, in your, your book as well. So uh, good luck with that. Okay, thank you. I see one question in the chat, actually, that I want to address sure. from uh, Suyash Joshi, because I'm surprised nobody asked it since you guys are heavily into AI. Um, and uh, the question was, um, what is the relationship between AI and interaction design? Um, if you look at the last chapter of the book, I am on the board of a AI startup that is implementing this book. You put in the requirements, it generates the UI and it generates the code, not just the design, but it can generate a fully functional application. So unless you are a really good UX designer to do the medical stuff, because it's going to probably not be my lifetime when the AI is good enough to do those kind of products. Um, but almost everything that I've explained to you can be automated by an AI. Okay, uh, here's another question in the chat. It's from uh, uh, Jeff Rosenberg. What difference do you see in semantic design applied to a virtual and or argumented reality applications? It, it, it works in AI in AR and VR because in AR you're still applying objects to actions. You tend to um, superimpose attribute information on the objects, the physical object that people are looking at. But the physical object will be recognized um, cognitively as being the equivalent of a digital object. In VR, you create artificial objects that people manipulate. Where it becomes a little bit different is conversational UI because you don't have the visualization layer. And then you're putting much more load on um, uh, recall and short-term memory in conversational, well, you know, like a smart speaker, like Alexa. But it's still applicable because if you look at any conversational UI development environment, their terminology is all different, but an Alexa skill um, is just an object plus an action or set changing an attribute value of an object. Okay, here's another question from Dave. Can you please suggest some ways to learn the archetype of patterns like a swim lane, portal, canvas? Um, not sure I understand the question. Um, these archetypes exist. Um, you'll see them described in numerous pattern library books for UX and, in, and numerous standards published mostly by the enterprise vendors. So like the SAP Fiori design, which postdates me, I have nothing to do with it. When I was at SAP, um, I have a lot of descriptions of these patterns and examples of how to use them. Um, but there's a lot of patterned library books in the UX world. And if you're doing mobile, the best one is um, the one by Teresa Neal. Okay, uh, here's another one is, so what do you think the future design trends will be? Will, uh, where is the design going? Well, that's an incredibly broad question. And if I had a, <laughs> if I had a crystal ball, I would have retired when I was like 21 or 22. <laughs> so I'm not good at predicting the future. I think what we're gonna see because of AI is we're gonna see, um, a lot of personal UX. The same way in medicine with genomics, we're beginning to see the uh, advent of personalized medicine based on your own DNA and things like that. So um, things will just become a better fit, um, probably not because designers are necessarily getting better, but because systems are getting smarter and hopefully trained without bias to serve your needs. Okay, here's another question from uh, uh, Greg Mikowski. Uh, will you, uh, see where is it? Oh, here's another question here. Okay, this one. 
Uh, do you would you like to post your uh, talk slides on somewhere on on the website? No problem. I can send them. Okay. So you can send out the, send that to uh, to us. Yes. Post down here. Okay. I don't see anything else interesting coming up. Okay. Then let's call it a night. I can call it a okay. night. Thank you right. for inviting me. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Thank you for for making yourself available and come over here to to see our uh, chaos before the meeting. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. And Mike, do you have anything else? No, I think it's a wrap. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dan, for uh, for this talk. And we hope we'll, we'll, we'll meet you again. Okay, thank you. We'll see All you right. at an ACM event. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. -bye. Okay, bye.